Hello, everybody, and welcome to From Rewatch with Love, a rewatch podcast looking at the James Bond cinematic franchise. My name is Graham Stark. Joining me is Matt Wiggins. Hello. And today we are talking about 1965's Thunderball. We sure are. Which has to be thought of by people who haven't seen it recently as one of the all-time classics. And I'm here to tell you, I don't think that's the case. Yeah. I think I commented to you the other day that I have sort of mentally classified this one as being better than it got credit for. And truth be told, I had sort of mentally classified it. Like, I have sort of taken it as one of the ones that everybody's like, well, it's it's fine. Uh, and I'm like, no, no, the Thunderball rules. Thunderball's a great film. What What is everybody talking about? It's got all sorts of things. It's got everything you'd want in a Bond movie. It's got it's got harpoon guns and big underwater fight sequences and rocket packs and like what's not to love the bad guy has an eye patch bad guy has an eye patch it's got sharks it's got people being eaten by sharks like what is not to love i believe that it is probably sufficiently credited having now rewatched it yeah i think i think the what's not to love is just sort of the sum of those parts like the thing is there are great parts of this movie and overall it is still a fun romp, but I, I mean, I don't know, maybe we're getting ahead of ourselves, but it was just, I was like, okay, this could have been better. And I, I don't know. I, I was definitely with you as that. I was like, okay, all right, Thunderball. Now we're, you know, we've got, got three movies under our belts. Now we're really settling in here. And I was just sort of like, huh? All right. So again, 1965, Largely the same production team. Terrence Young returns. He was the director of the first two movies. This would be his third and final turn in the director's chair. Screenplay by Richard Maybaum and John Hopkins. Same editing team. Ken Adam is back as production designer. But some very interesting and important for the franchise as a whole changes in some of the credits because this is the only eon production james bond film the mainline james bond movies of which harry salzman and cubby broccoli are not credited as producers they are credited as executive producers Hmm. but this is the only one they're not credited as producers because there's a producer credit for this movie to kevin mcclory and i've really been trying to wrap my head around this and here's what happened as best as i understand it okay Before Dr. No, Ian Fleming was wanted to work on a James Bond movie. He and screenwriters Jack Whittingham and Kevin McClory got together and worked on this story that they were calling Thunderball, from which Jack Whittingham wrote a screenplay. That didn't end up going anywhere. And then later, Fleming wrote a book called Thunderball that borrowed heavily from that screenplay, which then prompted Kevin McClory to file suit against Fleming for using creations of his from the screenplay in the novel. Mm. They ended up settling. And this is also why the first James Bond movie wasn't Thunderball, because there was legal stuff surrounding the, the book. But they wanted to make a Thunderball movie, and so they had to basically buy out Kevin McClory's interest in the story and the creations of his contributions to the original Thunderball screenplay that later became the novel upon which this is, you know, reasonably based. And part of the terms of that were that it's the screenplay is credited to Richard Maybaum and John Hopkins based on the screenplay by Jack Whittingham's story by Kevin McClory, Jack Whittingham, and Ian Fleming, and that Kevin McClory was given a producer credit, and that Kevin McClory retained rights to make a movie of his Thunderball story after a certain amount of time. And indeed, eventually... That would happen. This is 1965, and in 1983, almost 20 years later, Warner Brothers, a different production company with Kevin McClory, would release Never Say Never Again, starring Sean Connery returning to the role for the first time in, I think, 
12 or 15 years at that point. And that movie is basically just Thunderball again, but with Sean Connery and made by a completely different production team. Mm -hmm. And so I've always wondered, I was like, what is the story here? And this is, this is basically sort of how it all, how it all came to be. And at some point, you know, in sort of chronological order, we intend to look at Never Say Never Again, because the thing is, it was actually very successful. And I don't know if I have ever seen it. Oh. But it was considered in its day as a pretty good Bond film, even though Sean Connery was getting on in the tooth a little bit. <laughs> Nearly ancient, as I recall. Yeah, but it, it came out the same year as a actual mainline Bond movie as well. It did. And so, it, you know, gosh, the MGM folks and Saltzman and Broccoli must have just been so annoyed. Why go and see this Roger Moore Bond movie when you can see Never Say Never Again with the original Bond, Sean Connery? Yeah, who apparently was a big part of getting the film produced at all. He was really keen on it. Huh. I mean, he also got paid a pr tremendous amount of money for it. And the title apparently was suggested by his wife who was credited for this in the credits no oh. because in an in an in an interview where he was asked if he would ever play bond again he said never again and so never say never again there you go aka thunderball to the remake mcclory boogaloo anyway <laughs> <laughs> so now we've now we've like gotten ahead our, uh, of ourselves within this episode and within this entire podcast series <laughs> <laughs> well it's just it's just important to sort of talk about the the production of this about why kevin mcclory is credited as a producer when it's like who's this clown what where'd this guy come from and why is he never seen again and so mm -hmm. yeah a, a budget of nine million dollars adjusted for inflation from 1965 73 million dollar budget for this one okay i can see it that that appears on screen Box office adjusted for inflation, $1.1 billion. Yep. This was a profoundly successful movie. This was the first Bond movie shot in widescreen Panavision. Ah, yes. That's it's, why there were no black bars on the sides of my screen. <laughs> yeah, it's weird. The first three movies, I don't know the technical name for it, but they were shot in not even quite widescreen. They were wider than four by three, but there were still little black bars on the left and right of screen. So um, it was not cinemascope, but it, you know, it, there's some technical name for it, but these were shot in Panavision, which are very wide. Panavision was an aspect ratio of 2.76 to one, I believe. The point is it's very wide and it looks really cool. And it's, so it's, it, everything seems very cinematic and awesome. And it means they had to reshoot the gun barrel sequence. So for the first time, Sean Connery is actually in it as the man playing James Bond walking walking down mm. the length of the gun barrel which I guess actually leads us neatly into let's talk about this movie shall we Yeah let's let's do that the pre-roll or pre-credit sequence Actually so I want to I'm so sorry to do this I actually want to cut in like immediately and say that this is the first instance of something that i'm a big fan of which is they do the gun barrel sequence and then the circle of the gun barrel pans as it's falling as the holder of that gun dies i guess the circle pans to a certain part of the screen and becomes a circular vignette that then opens to the pre-title sequence this is the first one that they did that in previously the white circle just sort of disappeared and this time they're using it as a scene transition which they would continue to do going forward, and I really like. Yeah, yeah, that's, like, iconic. So, very good. So what does it open on? It opens on uh, none other than James Bond attending a funeral. For somebody with the initials JB, which I guess is meant to be a fake-out, even though you see Bond after, like, seven seconds. The camera then quickly sort of pulls back, and we see that the, the owner of the casket is not, in this case, James Bond, but the person in the casket is colonel jock bouvar who is a specter agent that is responsible for the death of two british agents but the suspense lasts maybe five seconds before we see bond looking at it so it's a kind of a weird thing yeah i assume it's just a cute callback so we have a conversation in the sort of like loft above where this funeral is taking place between james bond and a uh, a female character 
I don't remember who she is. This is Madame La Barbie, a French Secret Service agent. Okay. Who is played by Maurice Guy Mitsuko. Okay. So we have this conversation between, that was a lot of names, between this French Secret Service agent and James Bond. This is where we get the information that that Jacques Bouffard was responsible for the death of previous a- or of British agents. Bond basically says that he's glad he's dead and that he would have had to have do- done it himself if if it weren't already the case that the guy was dead because he had killed these agents and he would he would want to get revenge. So we follow the procession outside to the sort of like gravel driveway of this this chapel where the the funeral is being held bond sees the the grieving widow head for the car and open the door for herself we get a a sort of long shot of the the woman getting into the car and it seems to be especially focused sort of on her legs we then cut to this like fancy country home in france i assume where the the grieving widow arrives home and walks in the door and who who should happen to be in the room but Bond himself. Bond walks up to the widow, makes some sort of vaguely, vaguely sort of threatening quips, and then punches her right in the face, basically. Starts a huge brawl in the middle of this, like, reading room, basically. And, of course, the widow's veil and hat flies off. And it turns out that the widow had actually been none other than Jacques Bouvard himself, having faked his own death in an attempt to get the heat from British and French Secret Service off his back. And for whatever reason, deciding that the best way to keep a low profile was to show up to his own funeral and drag. (laughs) No doubt. And then Bond, of course, quips, you should have let someone else open the car door for you. That's, I guess, how he knew that, that this was a man in disguise. Yeah. So we have a big fight around the room. It's actually like it's a pretty good fight, all things considered, of Bond and Bouvard duking it out in this mansion until such a time as uh, Bond manages to get a hold of fireplace poker and uses it to strangle Bouvard to death. Bond sort of picks himself up, dusts himself off. There are, you know, people coming because of all the commotion so bond goes to make his escape but as he gets to the door he notices a vase full of flowers next to the door so he grabs the flowers out of the vase and tosses them on the corpse of bouvard uh before exiting he runs up to the roof straps on a jet pack and uses the jet pack to escape the the like the mansion property into the street in front as like other ostensible specter agents or what have you for security forces for the mansion are shooting at him from behind and he lands next to the car where uh madame la barbie madame la La barbie is watching the car and he loads the jetpack into the the back of the car saying something to the effect of like no well-dressed man should be without one in relation to the jetpack and then they both hop in the car and there's a a brief battle with the pursuers and we get you know a gadget usage of the the db5 the aston martin db5 where the the bulletproof plate comes back up and then he uses water cannons from the exhausts of the the db5 to bowl them all over in the street before he drives away so a couple points here first of all fun fact colonel bouvard played by sean connery's stuntman bob simmons so they get to actually both have a fight nice (laughs) i'm you but stronger (laughs) second thing the jetpack very sci-fi not a special effect i'm sorry what that's it's a real thing it they had a air force person come and fly that thing it got like very poor like i want to say like 60 feet of flight time but it worked it was a prototype what like that yeah that the the jetpack actually actually worked and the reason that there's a really obviously conspicuous rear projection shot of sean connery putting on a helmet is because the producers were like well it'd look way cooler if bond didn't wear a helmet while he was doing this and the operator was like absolutely effing not 
there's no <laughs> way I'm not flying this thing without wearing a helmet. And they eventually were like, okay, fine, you can wear a helmet, I guess. And then so they had to put in this shot of Bond putting the helmet on so that it matched with the shots of the performer. But yeah, it, it's not attached to a crane or anything. The thing actually flies. Wow. Okay, that that blows me away. So I knew the jetpack was based on like a real experimental design, right? Like mm-hmm. it, it's it, anybody who's ever seen a picture of like prototype jetpacks from the 60s has seen this design, right? So like that much I was aware of, but I could have sworn to you because of how unnatural the flight path looks and there's a like a wide shot of him dangling in the air basically like hanging just perpendicular in the air very awkwardly sort of like scooting towards the camera that that i was i would have put money down on the fact that he was attached to a crane the fact that it works is really cool this was the bell aero systems bell rocket belt or man rocket that they were developing for the u.s army and it was, yeah, it was a gas cylinder containing nitrogen gas and two cylinders containing highly concentrated hydrogen peroxide. And this mixed together was led to two insulated curved tubes and two nozzles. The pilot can vector the thrust by altering the direction of the nozzles. Despite achieving enormous success demonstrating the rocket pack in action before the public, and it was used to promote the movie as well, the maximum flight duration was 21 seconds with a range of 120 meters. So the U.S. Army... <laughs> was very disappointed it also used five gallons of hydrogen peroxide during during that 21 second flight (laughs) so efficient form of travel is what you're telling me there you go also at the end of the sequence they you never see them escape it's they just spray the guys with water and then the the titles sort of the screen goes wibbly like it's wet and then transitions to the opening titles you never actually see bond leave like the car doesn't move yeah (laughs) huh all right so where does this fall? Let's rank this. Where does this fall on the 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 power ranking of of pre-title sequences? Honestly, it's still fun. You've got a lot going on. There's a fight. Bond kills a guy. He does a very James Bond maneuver of making it easier for the guys to kill him by pausing so he can throw flowers on the corpse. <laughs> There's gadgets. He gets to fly a jetpack. That's cool. I don't think this is as good as the one in front of Goldfinger, which I guess puts this at number three for me so far. I agree with you completely. It's it, it checks a bunch of boxes, but it's sort of like, hey, all right, sure. You know, it's fun, but all right. Yeah. So the opening titles, got to talk about the opening titles. Maurice Binder is back. As I mentioned last episode, he would be from here all the way up through License to Kill. And this is the one where he settles into a groove because there is underwater sequences in this movie. So he's like, great, we'll get nude women. We'll put them underwater. We'll film silhouettes of them. And that'll be the opening title sequence. And that's it. And now the last one opening title sequence was just clips of the movie projected onto someone's body. And this is just titles with silhouettes of women underwater. So like this in a vacuum as the first time it happened is like, all right, sure. Cool. But he would go back to this well a lot. And so it's it's unfair to, to be like, to judge Thunderball based on what I know is forthcoming. But <laughs> I just, I, I know that this is like, this is, it's a very rote thing. But this is the first time it happened. So I guess I shouldn't really rip on Bender too much in this case. <laughs> yeah, it was innovative at this point. Yeah. So yeah, it's it, it's all just silhouettes of nude women and dudes with harpoon guns under the song thunderball sung by sir tom jones yeah the song rules it's good even come out and say it i think the song rules honestly it does even if tom jones did have to ask john barry during recording what does he strikes like a thunderball mean to which the response was (laughs) (laughs) yeah this song this song slaps unironically it does a really good job i think of setting itself apart from the previous movie like goldfinger also the theme song for that movie rules it manages to set a completely different tone while also continuing to like you hear it and you're like oh this is a bond theme it sounds Mm -hmm. next to nothing like goldfinger but it's like oh 
well, this is what a Bond theme should sound like. And it like really, really sort of locks in the tone along with Goldfinger around like these are what the prototypical Bond themes should sound like. And if you're going to make a Bond theme for the next several decades until they ultimately decided to start experimenting a little more, these are the bar to achieve, right? They can be like, they can be different styles. This is, you know, this is obviously a very different musical style from Goldfinger. They they can be like stylistically different, but they've got to be belters, right? To be like the really like strong, really powerful hook <laughs> for the movie and they will drift away from this they won't even drift away from it knowing what's what's coming next they will like take a hard right turn in the next movie but i think this one i think i think this song just locks in the the bar against which all other bond themes will be measured i should say i agree with everything that you just said my only criticism of this song is that whereas the last one goldfinger was singing all about this evil genius of goldfinger and how he's got the midas touch and he likes gold and you know all of that you know, he loves only gold etc cetera, etc cetera. that this one i believe is about james bond and is just like song jerking bond off like it's the entire <laughs> song is just like it's just like this guy is so amazing seriously this guy in the movie you're about to watch oh man let me tell you all the ways about how awesome he is like holy crap he's so good at stuff and he's amazing and you can't you can't beat him god this guy james bond he's he'll tell you <laughs> he's gonna he's gonna strike like a thunderball because they're not singing about largo no yeah you're 100 percent right yeah and it's like eh, you know yeah, tonally i'm like i don't think bond needs your help you don't need to tell me <laughs> how great he is i'm already in the theater but I still agree with everything you said. <laughs> yeah, I think that's fair. I I will I will subsequently agree with everything you have just said. <laughs> <laughs> so after the opening titles, we get this shot in France where you can tell it's France because the sign in the foreground says Tête de Station and there's a giant Eiffel Tower in the background. It's you couldn't find a more we're now in France establishing shot. And uh, we see a man parking in the you can't park here zone. A parking attendant or police officer comes over to chide him for doing so. But he turns around. And then as soon as the parking attendant sees his face and the fact that his face has an eye patch on it, he goes, oh, I'm so sorry. And, and salutes him no less. This man is Emilio Largo, as we will find out momentarily, Spectre number two. Mm -hmm. He goes into a building with a French sign on the door of course it's in french because it's in france which is a uh, center international d'assistance aux personnes déplacées yes which is international center for displaced persons yep which is sort of like a immigration assistance kind of place yeah for like stateless people i think yeah and you you sort of hear discussions as it's going through and, and people being like oh this is amazing we'll be able to settle down and actually start a life here and then if you know of course we'll pay everything back and then the person's like oh no no there will be no need this is all very you know it's this it's clear this is a very humanitarian front <laughs> yeah for, for specter i think my favorite little bit about this whole thing like it's yeah definitely it's a front you see him walk in you're like oh he's he's clearly somebody important he's he's clearly somebody who's like here for the like he's a diplomat or something and then he walks in and he pulls it out this like i don't know cigarette case sized device and flips it up and there's just it's this entire cigarette case sized device with a flip top cover for the purposes of hiding a single button, which he presses and it causes a, a bookcase to recede. I, I just love the I love the the giant button device <laughs> that he's like he stops in the hallway and sort of looks around to make sure nobody's watching and then like flips the thing open and then really like conspicuously mashes the buttons and then the door opens in front of him. I think that's my favorite bit. I like how he's looking around to make sure no one's watching him and this door opens at a glacial pace. <laughs> it's just like, if somebody was there, they would absolutely see you. Oh, yeah. So anyhow, he goes through the bookcase door and uh, down a flight of stairs, presumably into the underground. And no, he we, just uh... walks right through the door, actually. Oh, 
it's literally on the other side of the door <laughs> yeah it makes no sense the door opens and there's this massive gorgeous ken adams set of this like specter meeting room and it's just there on the ground level yeah but anyway yeah it's a specter meeting specter's back specter's back boy are they ever so he walks into the meeting he takes his place overall i think the details of the the meeting are not super important to the film as a whole but we get some good sort of like character building around blofeld here and sort of the operations of specter it's basically just a report right like it's morning stand-up it's specter's morning stand-up as like all of the the various specter agents are sort of seated around and they're reporting on the success of their initiatives right so like oh yeah we did this thing and and we made one point two million dollars. Oh yeah, we did this other thing, and and we made we made four point five million pounds. And then it comes to two guys who are like, I don't I don't remember which numbered agents they are. It's like eight and nine or something like that. And they were like, we we did essentially they they like released drugs into the U.S. market, and they report back I don't know one point some odd million dollars. It's like we we did this as a, a combined initiative and, and we we flooded the market with drugs and we made this much money. And he's like, well, that's and Blofeld responds with, well, that's significantly below our projections. What happened? And the guy responds is like, well, you know, we, we had some unforeseen like unforeseen difficulties and the like the cartels were all you know there was unforeseen competition where we had competing drugs released into the market and so our our return wasn't as good as we expected it to be and blofeld responds is like no that's not it one of you's been skimming money and i know who it is and the two agents the the presentation of the two agents are hilarious because like the one agent is barely paying attention he's like sitting there looking at his notebook like grinning and the guy who's giving the report is sitting there sweating bricks like he he looks <laughs> yeah. beside himself with stress and uh blofeld is just like i i i have i have seen the receipts basically i know which of you it is and i have already determined your punishment and will execute it now and he presses a button and the guy who who was like not paying attention at all gets electrocuted in his chair and then the chair like dumps him into a hatch and then comes back all charred and smoking and the guy who looks beside himself with stress sort of like collapses back into his chair relieved it's really great that they're just like you know it's, it's like really obvious who's gonna get it and then it doesn't doesn't happen sort of shades of the scene with frau kleb and constein in the in from russia with love mm. and this yeah. is this is very much once again this is very much the source of the scene in austin powers where 100 percent will ferrell's character is goes through a trapdoor and set on fire <laughs> <laughs> uh specter number one or blofeld here is once again played by anthony dawson uncredited and voiced by it's actually i'm not gonna say who voices him because it is a matter of dispute oh whether it is voiced by the same guy as before eric pullman or someone else whose name escapes me for the time being but it's probably eric pullman but anyway yeah anthony dawson uncredited again as blofeld there's a period of time after blofeld showed up in many many movies between then and the much more recent film specter where the character of Blofeld couldn't be used by the Aeon Productions until finally the Thunderball movie rights that were used to make Never Say Never Again were eventually sort of re-enveloped into MGM and the Aeon Productions sort of house, I guess. Right. And then that's why they eventually brought Blofeld back for a period of time they actually couldn't which i was unaware of interesting anyway after we hear from everybody else we finally do then hear from specter number two emilio largo played by adolfo selli and voice dubbed by robert rietti because of course no one can actually deliver their own lines <laughs> <laughs> oh actually one sec there is another one of the specter guys specter number five reports about how he helped plan the great train robbery he's from the english branch of specter and the great oh, train yeah. robbery 
was a real thing that happened of a robbery of 2.6 million pounds from a Royal Mail train in 1963. And so this is similar to the painting from the first movie. This is referencing a real world thing and being right. like, oh, that was that was Spectre who did that. Oh, Spectre. Those rascals. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. All right. So we hear from Largo. And he doesn't say much. He just talks about how plans are in motion and that their man is at a health clinic near the airfield essentially he just sort of is he's he's very vague about it and we then transition to that health clinic near the airfield and we see the man presumably they're talking about as he enters the room and talks to another person who's staying at this health clinic who happens to be james bond that's right this is the shrublands health clinic and bond notices that this man who's just come out of some sort of steam treatment or something has a tattoo on his wrist and he sort of glances at it and the man notices him glancing at it and then covers it up with a medical bracelet that he's putting back on and bond is immediately like oh that's hmm that's weird and we later see him calling into money penny describing the symbol it's actually it's a red dragon symbol it's sort of like the square the red square with the line through it bond says he figures it's a tong sign like a chinese gang and that maybe there's something to that and so she says she's going to look into it right she also is like you're on vacation so how about you like chill out <laughs> and of course he then starts skulking around the guy's room this is count lippy i should say I, I should say the the character's name that he's looking at is count lippy he basically waits until the guy like goes away and and breaks into lippy's room and skulks around looking for, looking for information. While he's doing this, the door starts to open. So he hides behind the door as somebody opens the door and looks in and then sees everything, like because Bond is hiding behind the door, sees everything quiet, and so closes the door and goes back to his room. Bond slips back into the hallway and heads back to his room. As he does, I believe we see the bandaged head of the individual in the neighboring room sort of peek out and look just to see who's walking down the hallway. Yeah, and you don't really know who that guy is or what's up, but then we cut to the next scene with Bond having an x-ray of his examined. And God, I know we talked in the first episode about just sort of in general the issues that the Bond franchise and in specific the character have with women, but... This movie and these these scenes with this particular character, the nurse at the health clinic, are especially egregious. Like, oh, yeah, these, these are just some outright like rapist shenanigans from Bond here. And it's super uncomfortable. Oh, like, yeah, I I had forgotten. I sort of vaguely remembered i was like oh he gets like really pushy with the nurse at this thing doesn't he i had forgotten how bad it was it's like really gross yeah bond has his x-ray examined the the nurse finds a bruise on his torso and he's he says he he got it from a like a fireplace poker presumably alluding to the fight in the opening scene and she mm -hmm. She says that she's going to put him on a device that the patients at the, the health clinic refer to as the rack. And it's a table that stretches the spine, she says. Yeah. She straps him in commenting, this is the first time I've really felt safe all weekend, which is also like <laughs> big red flag. Yeah. Turns it on and it starts just sort of doing vaguely awful things, like sort of stretching him out all weird. And then she says she's going to leave him on there for like, 20 minutes or something yeah she says she's gonna leave him on for for 15 minutes i'm this is where i'm gonna refer briefly to somebody else's writing on like on the james bond movies because i think like film crit hulk has a great description of this which is it's just one of those silly things that's in a bond movie where he he's he's on a sex table he's sitting there having sex with the table <laughs> that's what this looks like it looks like he's humping the table it does look like that because it's like stretching him and then releasing him and so he just looks like he's humping the table and then the bad guy breaks into the room and cranks the machine up to maximum in an attempt to kill bond in a really circuitous attempt to kill bond because it would be would have been much easier to just 
stab him. But anyhow, he comes in, turns the machine on full, and of course the machine goes crazy. And so now Bond is humping the table to death. Yeah, yeah. And, and it's it's really silly. Like Film Crit Hulk does a great bit on this in in his writing. You should go read it. But anyhow, the like, can you think of a more perfect way for Bond to die? I'm not sure I can. <laughs> Than having sex with a table <laughs> to death. Yeah, yeah. So anyhow, the the nurse comes in and at at well like he he manages to survive it for 15 minutes but is like passing out and then the nurse comes in and is like oh no <laughs> she gives the weakest excuse she's like i i don't know what what could possibly have happened i don't know what went, went wrong you must have bumped the control knob with your hand which is strapped to the table not at all in reach of the control rod but she she rescues him and is is like okay you know i'm glad you're all right i you know i'm sorry about this and then we get to the like yeah the the most rapist shenanigans ever in anything we have seen so far he's already forced himself on her at one point which is why she then put him on this table and now he uses the fact that someone tried to kill him with this table as emotional leverage to basically be like you know if if you have sex with me i won't tell your boss that your horrible table went haywire yeah he, he just coerces her into it like yeah it, it it's it's it has not aged well it is no a, i mean it was it, this scene was never good <laughs> no it should be mentioned the next time we see bond and patricia fearing is the name of this character that she's totally cool with it and they're just sort of palling about in bed yeah nurse fearing here played by molly peters also dubbed what <laughs> Yeah, no. Dubbed by Barbara Jefford. Don't know why. Director must have thought she had a weird voice. Who can I say? I guess so. Yeah. After a hilarious, air quotes, cut to Bond exiting a room labeled irrigation, he goes to the bathroom. Not the not the bathroom, but the room with the baths in it. That was an awkward. He goes to a room <laughs> with like these weird steam cabinets. It's like a sauna for one where there's a man sitting in it that we assume is the man that tried to kill him. And he puts a broom through the door to trap him in the heat bath. It's kind of unclear what the hell is happening. So it is a steam bath. You're right. So it's, it's Lippe that's in the steam bath who bond is pretty sure is a, uh, like is the guy that tried to kill him because he was, he was asking around about Lippe and skulking around Lippe's room. And so when the attempt on his life is made, he thinks, of course, that the, the obvious person to have done it is Lipe. But it is a steam bath. You're right. They are steam cabinets. And so what he does is he walks into the room. He turns the heat to maximum and then locks him in the cabinet and then walks out of the room and like closes the door and puts like a do not disturb sign or whatever on it outside, leaving Lipe to basically cook to death. It's just sort of unclear what anyone's motivations are because bond doesn't know that this guy is part of a specter plot he's just he saw the tong sign and started doing stuff and it's just kind of like why is this happening from a structural look at the movie and how it's laid out why is this happening right anyway we're yeah. only 20 minutes in <laughs> <laughs> yeah so one of the things he does do he asks about the bandaged guy in the room next to Lipe's and who he is and and what's going on. Yeah, he asks he asks Nurse Fearing actually while he's giving her a massage with a mink glove. Oh, that's right. There's a scene in between where we go to a house nearby in town where there's a man and woman in bed and the man gets a call that he has to go into the Air Force Base, and he starts getting dressed. The man is Francois Durval. He's a French Air Force pilot, and he has to go in for this mission that he's doing where they're, he's sort of, he's a NATO inspector, and he's going to be on this airplane called the Vulcan that is transporting two nuclear warheads. And he's in bed with this woman, Fiona Volpe, who is his mistress, 
and we're going to find out very quickly is actually also a specter agent and she's sort of like oh you'll be so tired when you come back you know i'll still be here for you though tee and he's like oh uh, you and then puts puts his uniform on goes to the door you know says ciao and then opens the door to be greeted by himself another man outside the door dressed like him who looks exactly like him and who hits him with a tranquilizing powder spray and then the man falls to the ground at this point the double and fiona and who's the third man is that count lippy at that point in time it is this is after the bath thing what really oh lippy yeah. lives i guess he just got a prank pulled on him i guess I, it's it's it this is why this this part of the movie i'm sort of sort of confused on who's who but anyway it's Let's let's not get bogged down in those details. The point is they've replaced this man with a double. He they surgically altered his face. He says he studied tapes of this man for two years to get all of his mannerisms correct. And they're they're putting him in his place so that he can steal this plane and these warheads for Spectre. Right. There's a brief moment where he holds them up for more money because he's like, what are you going to do? I'm the one who's been studying this guy for two years that you've done all the facial reconstruction on. Without me, there's nothing. So instead of $100,000, kick it up to a quarter million. And they're like, okay, fine. And you just know from watching this movie, you're like, oh, that guy's so dead. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you you well, know that just from like Spectre. Why? Yeah. That's the, the, it is literally the criminal organization. One of their key operational pillars is extortion. And the, yeah. one of their other key organizational pillars is revenge. <laughs> yeah. What are you thinking? <laughs> so they wrap the real Derval up in bandages and send him back to Shrublands to to sort of, I don't know why they don't just like hide the body. It seems kind of weird. So Bond starts skulking around at Shrublands and finds this guy dead. Lippy is there with a gun hiding and he doesn't doesn't want to kill Bond unless he absolutely has to. And there's another man there who's hiding in the shadows who Bond attacks and knocks the gun out of his hand. And then he trips the fire alarm and then everyone comes running out of their rooms and Nurse Fearing is upset at Bond for causing trouble. But yeah. Bond takes the bandages off the guy's face and so that he he knows what this guy looks like. And sort of that's that's the end of that scene he doesn't know who it is he's just seen his face right and we see also separately from that the double is successfully up in the vulcan they're sort of like oh inspector you want to ride up in the cockpit and sort of see how this goes we saw earlier that he'd been provided both with nerve gas and an isolated oxygen supply and so he puts the nerve gas into because it's a very high altitude plane he puts the nerve gas into the oxygen supply for the plane plugs into his own oxygen supply assumes direct control of the plane <laughs> and then flies it to a water crash landing zone basically to steal these warheads as soon as it moves away there's a brief scene of sort of the raf being like well, one of our planes has gone missing it's, oh, why was it? better look into it oh, i'll get a hold of mi6 what what and we see the plane touch down near Largo's boat, a super yacht by the name of the Disco Volante. That's a good name. It is I a very, like very name. good name. It's a good name. That that This whole sequence is actually pretty cool. It's paced really nicely. It's one of those things that sort of, you know, it all makes sense in universe. They turn on these like underwater landing lights so that he knows where to go. He sort of does a delicate crash water landing and then the plane sinks to the bottom and then these scuba divers all show up and steal the warheads he can't get out of his seat belt and so largo swims up to him and he's like help help me get out of the seat belt can't breathe seat belt trapped here and largo just sort of waves he's like bye bye and cuts his air his air hose mm -hmm. so that he so you know he didn't as we said derval's days were numbered at that point shouldn't have held them up for more money they delicately transfer the warheads to a fun little orange underwater specialty warhead transfer scuba submarine i guess yeah they drag a huge camouflage net over the plane 
and then they all go back uh, up underneath into the super yacht because the super yacht has like an underwater it secretly has this like underwater room in it where the scuba guys can come in and out of so so that's it specter has successfully made off with these two nuclear warheads step one of the plan is a success and he reports as much in to specter number one so at this point we cut over to mi6 headquarters all of the double o agents have been assembled for a briefing because of course two nuclear missiles or two nuclear bombs have gone missing that's a pretty big deal so we have the like defense secretary for the uk and and all of the top brass of uh actually i'm sorry can i can i cut in briefly just before there is a brief scene of bond leaving shrublands and seeing the body of the man in bandages that he doesn't know the identity of being carried out to an ambulance and in the scene where largo reported into specter number one aka blofeld blofeld says count lippy has failed you know what to do alert the oh he has some cool word for it it's like the removal team or something like that you know basically <laughs> you know count lippy's failed so you should you should take him out so bond is driving away from shrublands lippy is now pursuing him in a car and firing at him just like with a revolver out the window so bond is like oh okay and like flips open his middle console to try and do some fun gadget stuff when somebody on a motorbike drives up behind count lippy fires a rocket out of the front of their motorbike and destroys lippy's car and him as well right before the motorbike overtakes bond drives away the rider gets off the motorbike runs the motorbike into a lake and takes off their helmet showing that it this is fiona volpe the mistress of derval who we now find out is not only working for specter but also a very skilled assassin and so mm -hmm. bond is like what what in the heck just <laughs> happened there because bond was gonna get to do cool gadget stuff and then specter killed this guy anyway for being a complete failure you're right that did happen and consequently bond is late to the meeting there is a great little moment where bond peers his head around the door to money penny's office getting ready to fling his hat across the room as he's done in all the previous movies and the hat rack has been moved to right beside the door so he like winds up and he's like oh oh, oh. and just sort of uh, uh, <laughs> put put it there i guess and then yeah money penny is like you've got a yo bond the, you're you're late all the other double o's are here like all the double o's have been called in they're at the absolutely ridiculous set down the road. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> down the hallway. <laughs> yeah. So this this was the set that I was talking about in the last episode when I was saying like all of the extremely sort of like very like regal British sets for all the British institutions. And this this is one of those sets. This set is completely ridiculous in how like grand the scale of it is. <laughs> Mm -hmm. so we've got all the top brass at one side of the room in this sort of like v-shaped room basically but we've got all the top brass at one end of the room and then we have all the double o's in each of nine chairs set in a like a semicircle on one side of the room facing the front of the room uh, they're the, like these really ornate throne like chairs too but you can see there are s there are six double o agents and then there are two double o agents and then there's one empty seat and so mm -hmm. bond arrive arrives and very conspicuously makes his way across the room interrupting the whole meeting to take his seat uh, much to the chagrin of m the briefing gets underway and and basically it's the brass briefing the double o's on these two nukes have gone missing we are going to be sending you essentially all over the world because we we know what the radius of like we know where the plane launched from and we know what the plane's flight radius was and we know all of the potential targets and points of interest in that like within that radius that are likely targets for the bombs so we're, we're going to follow every lead. We're going to send each of you to a different location. Open up your packets with all of the intelligence that we have on this mission. And they sort of like start talking about it. And while Bond opens his pamphlet or his dossier, and as he's flipping through, he sees a photo of the NATO observer with his with a woman and determines in between this and the next scene determines where he thinks the best lead is. So he ends up 
in M's office. Before we move on from this scene of this astonishing set, a couple things I wanted to point out. So all the double O's, this is one of the only times we ever see other double O agents across all the James Bond franchise. And all the shots of them are very carefully framed so that we never get a clear shot of anyone's face. Among them, there is one woman. So I just want to point out that going back to 1965, the notion of a woman as a double O agent is canon. You sad people. (laughs) Originally, they had actually a really funny, if kind of fourth wall shattering plan for this, which is that they wanted all of the other double O agents to be played by other known actors who played spies in movies <laughs> and TV shows because James Bond had been had been such a boom for the genre. So they wanted to have like Patrick McGowan from Secret Agent Man. They wanted to have the man from Uncle. They wanted to have Michael Caine. They, you know, like they wanted right. to have this as like a like a a rogues gallery cameo moment of like all these other famous spies from movies and TV but they couldn't like make it all work because it was just, you know, the the cost and the the scheduling was too much of a challenge. And so they had to drop the bit, which to be fair, I think would have been awesome, but also would have been a real like jarring <laughs> moment, yeah. I think. And I just wanted to mention that the when they throw to the when they throw to the Air Force guy, so he gestures to one of these massive tapestries, which are based on a based on a real series of tapestries that exist he gestures to him he's like okay tell us what you know and so the guy waves to the attendant who pulls on this rope and the tapestry raises up to reveal a map behind it it takes a full 10 seconds for this (laughs) tapestry to raise in silence we all just watched this tapestry raise and then all the guy says is well this is the possible range where it could be we haven't found anything <laughs> That's it. he's just like, well, we don't know anything. Back to you. And it's like, well, thanks, <laughs> thanks, thanks for your contribution, Jerry. It's a great map, though. Oh, it's ver- it's very cool. It's huge. It's so big, uh, and I I like the the right like emerging from the wall behind the tapestry is a great bit. I like they yeah. spend so much time on it, but I I think it it really sells the scene, even if the actual briefing leaves something to be desired. Yeah. So yeah, Bond sees this photo of Derval, and he recognizes him as the guy that he just saw dead, even though he's just been told that this guy was on the plane, and he's it's a photo of him and his sister in the Bahamas. And so he he's like, well, I'd like to go to the Bahamas. <laughs> M tries to assign him to Station C, Canada. Yes. Because he's basically like, look, we have nothing. We need to send everybody around the world. So Bond, you'll be assigned to Canada. And Bond's like, I would rather go to Nassau. And M's like, why? Why do you <laughs> want to go to the Bahamas, James? And then he explains why. And M's like, oh, okay. All right. Yeah, no, actually. it's I really like this because M has this moment of like, what kind of bullshit are you up to, James? And then when he explains it, he's like, oh, right, James is actually really good at this. And I yeah. actually I actually trust him to be making the right decisions here. I'm going to let him follow this lead. Yeah. You know, I, I, I really like that there is this moment of, even though that M is constantly like, all right, James, you know, you're back on your BS again, that he does still have the respect for the fact that Bond is actually still very good at his job. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just the the very tone of like, didn't you just come back from vacation? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Anyhow, he gets assigned to NASA and and that is where he heads. In fact, he catches up with Durval's sister underwater because we just cut right to they're both they're both snorkeling looking for like shells and starfish or whatever. Right. And she gets her flipper caught in some rocks and he just which is convenient and he saves her and they have a little conversation topside and then they're like, OK, cool. Bye. And they climb back into their respective boats. I mean, he, he he's really laying laying on the flirtation here very thick. And she's like, OK, cool. You know, but he's being he's being nice enough about it and then gets back in his boat with his local contact, Paula Kaplan, played, by the way, by Martin Beswick, who played one of the fighting Romany women 
in oh, yeah. From Russia with Love. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. I love I love her character in this movie. Oh, she's so good. She's so I love good. Her so much. She like when Bond is trying to find a way to insinuate himself onto Domino's boat, and he just yeah. like pulls the plug on the engine, and and she is clearly like just putting on the barest minimum of an act. <laughs> She's like, yeah. just shrugs awkwardly like, well, I guess we're going to need, I guess you're going to need to get a ride. You don't mind waiting here for the Harbor Authority to come pick you up, do you? Not at all, James. Like, it's very, <laughs> it's very good. So yeah, he, he convinces Dominique Domino Derval to give him a ride back into town. Domino played by Claudine Auger, shocking nobody. Claudine Auger, former beauty pageant queen, further shocking nobody voice dubbed by nikki vanderzeel there it is yeah yep <laughs> nikki, <laughs> nikki vanderzeel also dubbed honey rider and sylvia trench in previous bond films yeah yeah bond basically yeah he's like trying to insinuate himself into domino's life that's that's his whole play here because she is his only lead so he needs to get close to her so he hitches a ride back into town with Domino on her boat, giving some excuses like, oh, I've got an important meeting that I need to get to. And upon arriving on shore, immediately proceeds to invite her to lunch, which she calls him on. She's like, but what about your important meeting? When they're going up the beach, there's a man in the background in a suit and sunglasses who notices them, looks very confused, and then sort of like skulks after them. Because there's there's a man who was watching them with sunglasses because he's keeping an eye on Domino and he follows them. And then this other man with a suit and sunglasses who's sort of like, wait, what the what's going on here? And if you watch in the next several scenes, this man in a suit and sunglasses, he's conspicuously in the background of several shots, but not really featured. Like you really have to sort of keep an eye out. And he's really like not doing a good job of being hidden while keeping an eye on Bond. Right. This is the first time I've really noticed him. It will be revealed that this is actually Felix Leiter, played by Rick Van Nutter. Yes. This who... only works, <laughs> in fact, because they've changed the actor for Felix again. Yeah. Even though he's dressed the same as he was in the first movie where he was in Jamaica at that time. I guess he's just the CIA's holiday destination guy. Miami, <laughs> Jamaica, the Bahamas dude for being as bad at his job as he is well i mean he was in kentucky in the last one but the only after having been in miami i guess for as bad as as felix later appears to be at his job the like beleaguered and undersupplied this this gets played up i think more over the course of the franchise including in in more modern days where it's like Felix is just always sort of presented as being like underfinanced and a little beleaguered and like not actually very good at his job. Like he he hits a wall that only Bond can can push past in virtually like every instance. He he is very much just Bond's sidekick. But he's usually there first, right? Like he he usually sort of beats Bond there and then Bond shows up and he's like and then they I have now at least twice done like, oh, is there somebody here to kill Bond? Oh, wait, no, it's it's Felix. Ha ha. Look, it's Felix. And then Felix is like, you got to help. He does have money in Casino Royale when he buys Bond back into the into the into the poker game. That's right. Yeah. Maybe maybe just beleaguerment. He only does that because Felix like couldn't close the deal himself and is like, look, you're way better at poker than I am. Can I just pay your way back in? Because we think you have a shot. Yeah. So Bond goes to a dinner party after after having lunch with Domino, where they just sort of chat for a bit, and he starts kind of ingratiating himself. We finally get Bond and Largo meeting one another at the Baccarat table at the casino, which Bond proceeds to, as he did with Sylvia Trench and Dr. No, absolutely dumpster Largo at Baccarat. <laughs> yeah. The key piece of information I think we glean from this interaction is that Domino is essentially a, like Largo's lover, right? Like mm -hmm. she has, she sort of referred to him in, in the previous interaction with Bond as her uncle, but yes, she's, she's actually like his lover, uh, or at least has been and is now sort of, it has sort of like fallen out of infatuation with the idea, but is still sort of 
loyal, I guess. And so he's he's basically trying to suss out what's really going on and drive a wedge in there as best as best as he can. And mm-hmm. also, he's God Bond, such an ass. There's he's beating Largo at Baccarat, and Domino's like, "Hey, can I? I'd like to get a drink. Can I get a drink?" Because she's sitting beside him at the table, and Largo's like, "No, I'm not going to leave this table until I win my money back." And then Bond's like, "Oh, how about I buy her a drink?" And he's and he's like. <laughs> He's like, I would very much appreciate that. Yes, thank you. And he goes, okay, cool. Well, deal me out. And <laughs> takes her to get a drink. <laughs> just leaves Largo to keep playing Baccarat by himself while he take, take doesn't even take her to a, to a drink, takes her to dinner. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Fully, like, just leaves him behind. Bond and Domino then have dinner and they talk a bit about, you know, the sort of the relationship and what's going on. And he keeps asking questions about Largo's boat and... You know, will you be on board the boat tonight? You know, just sort of trying to get as much information as possible. She actually, again, she calls him on this. She's like, you keep asking me a lot of questions about this guy. I guess Bond's realizing he doesn't have much time, so he's not being particularly subtle about it. But Mm -hmm. she doesn't really seem to mind. Yeah. In in fact, so this, I'm going to go back to the Baccarat table for a moment because you've just reminded me of something. He, Bond again, being a giant jerk and also like extremely bold in this one fully outs himself at the baccarat table like he 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 sees largo's ring and like makes a comment about like the specter of bad luck or some such thing and then and then they start to play and he's like ah it'll be your specter against mine immediately outing himself to largo as like oh we're adversaries here it it takes it takes largo like 30 seconds after this game to to realize that bond is is there to mess with his plans yeah it's so weird that the times when bond is just like what's up i'm james bond i'm a spy i'm here to mess with your stuff and and it sort of it's it all works it's so it's so weird but also why is largo wearing a specter class ring just like do. out in a i know it's so it's so silly like it's so fiona, silly. fiona has one too yeah i know which ends up being a liability for her too like what a stupid thing after they have dinner largo comes and collects domino to return to the boat and as soon as they walk away from bond he's like so what did you talk about she said oh she, he asked me a lot about you really like what well he asked if we were both going to be on on board the boat tonight you know she's she's not working for bond at this point she's very much like she's like this guy's weird and he's you know he's asking questions about you my dude yeah also i think maybe it's worth commenting on that claudine auger it looks stunning in this scene just really does so bond goes back to his hotel room a joint hotel room with him and paula that they're sort of their two rooms connected Mm -hmm. and he goes in and finds this recording device that he has left rolls it back like a couple minutes and then plays it and then he hears a door opening someone walking through closing a door they do a cool thing where the camera sort of goes from bond's pov of like what's making the noises of like that door opens we hear someone walking across this part of the carpet and then that and then the tape gets up to when bond comes in so he's like oh so whoever that is is still in here So he gets his gun, puts a silencer on it, goes into the bathroom. And then we also see that the the man in the suit and the sunglasses is knocking on the door of his room. So Bond opens the door, sees it's Felix, recognizes it's Felix. But Felix is like, oh, hey there, double. And then Bond (laughs) socks him in the gut. (laughs) And drags him in. Yeah. Yeah. To stop him saying 007. I don't know why he's so worried about keeping his identity secret now. Yeah. Goes into the bathroom cranks the water because the man is hiding in the shower the water is immediately hot somehow it's like matt's ultimate fantasy (laughs) i mean it may just be that it's extremely cold water right like there's steam comes out oh i guess all right you've 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 bested me (laughs) the water is immediately hot and that is indeed my fantasy so he knocks the guy down, takes his gun. Felix and him rough him a little bit and they say, all right, run back. Tell tell your boss that the the small fish I throw back, but I'm coming for the big fish, basically. 
And so we then see that man go to Largo's house. It's a palatial estate named Palmyra, where Largo keeps sharks in the pool. Yep. And he reports basically what happened. Doesn't actually tell Largo the thing that Bond wanted him to pass on. Largo's just like, why are you here? Did you kill him? And the guy's like, no, he hit me. And Largo's like, wow, you suck at this. All right, guys, throw him in the pool. And they just chuck him in with the sharks. They do indeed. I don't think this movie was able to care, even if this is a thing they did in the 60s, which I doubt it was, I don't think this movie was able to carry a no animals were harmed in the making of this movie disclaimer at the end, considering there's a moment where the stuntman asked for an extra $400 before he would do the shot where he had to uh, jump and land on a shark in the pool. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, yeah. Yeah, we do see that shot in the movie where the guy just fully lands ass first on a shark. Huh. So... I want to talk about this pool a little bit. Yeah, please. Because this pool is great. This is this is very James Bond villain, this pool, because it's it's like a swimming pool and a shark pool. And they're on different sides of like a wall, right? Like they're not together, but there's a corridor between them. So I don't know if I'm building if I'm building a resort or like a mansion, a palatial estate, as you described it in the Bahamas. And I'm the kind of person who wants to keep a pool of sharks for my thrill and amusement. I don't think I'm the kind of person who builds a passageway for the sharks to swim between the swimming pool and the shark tank. That seems like a needless liability. (laughs) Doesn't it, though? (laughs) Doesn't doesn't that seem like it could be a problem? I, I wouldn't feel safe swimming in my swimming pool if i knew that there was a passageway between that pool and my shark pool yes especially as it will become relevant later if i know that there's a a a sheet of metal grating that can extend over the swimming pool like if i'm the only person who owns the controller for that and the only person who owns the controller for the passageway doors maybe maybe I, even then, I'd probably be still pretty iffy about swimming in the swimming pool, but maybe I'd be, you know, comfortable enough to swim in my own pool, secure in the knowledge that only I have the capability to do the things with it. But anybody else, like anybody else, if you, Graham, you're one of my dearest friends, but if you <laughs> owned yeah. a palatial estate that had a shark tank and a <laughs> swimming pool, and there was a passageway between the two, and you called me up one day and were like, hey, Matt, come on over to my pool party. It's going to be the best. It's going to be a real <laughs> bang in time. I would still probably say no. Yeah, that's that's fair. <laughs> that's fair. I think after I had the whole thing installed, I'd be like, hey, guess what? I've ruined my pool. <laughs> I agree with you completely. Yeah. So they throw him in the pool and he gets fed to the sharks. Yeah. Later that day or the next day or some other time, it's sort of unclear, Bond and Felix and Paula and Pinder, who is the Bahaman intelligence operative, who's their contact in NASA, go to a sort of secret, I don't know if it's a CIA site or an MI6 site, but anyway, they head over there and who is there dressed in a Hawaiian shirt and Bermuda (laughs) shorts, but Q, much to Bond's dismay. And so we get the terrific... Q sequence of showing off the gadgets and Bond continually messing with stuff. There's yeah. a lot of really subtle small bits like Bond putting his hat down on something and Q immediately wordlessly moving it off. Just yeah. no, no, not not that. You know, and Bond keeps playing with there's like a underwater sort of submarine thing with a light on the front and a propeller on the back that he'll end up wearing much later in the movie. There's a camera that has a hidden Geiger counter inside it. And the thing that comes up a couple times is a tiny rebreather that sort of fits into something about the size of a cigar case and is good for four minutes of underwater breathing, which apparently the U.S. Navy, who had been developing something kind of similar but wasn't able to get it right, were like, oh, how did they do it? And contacted the production and were like, <laughs> you got to tell us how your prop department actually made this thing work. And they were sort of had to sheepishly respond. Oh, the, the actors held their breath. Like <laughs> the, the thing, the thing doesn't actually 
do four minutes of breathing time in something that small. So, oh, and oh. and also a a pill with a a like mildly radioactive pill that will allow Bond to be tracked if he swallows it. Right, is I think how that's supposed to work. I should yeah. say I don't I, the I don't actually think that we talked about. Because the next scene is we actually go back to that palatial room at MI6. And we didn't mention in the prior scene with all the double O's there that there's a tape from Largo doing the, you know, the Dr. Evil routine of like, we are now in possession of two nuclear devices. And unless the U.S. and United Kingdom each give us the equivalent of 10 million pounds or, you know, however much they ask for, you know, with inflation, it's irrelevant how much they ask for, you know, we will detonate one at a target yet to be determined. You have however long to comply, signal your compliance by having big Ben strike eight times at 7 PM on this date. You know, you, you will hear from us again. So they're, they're up against the clock where it's like the governments have said they'll do it because they kind of have to, yeah. So we need you all to figure this out before it gets to that point and the you know time is really is really counting down. Yeah, they they had 72 hours as I recall until they had to like deliver the money and it was 24 hours. it was like essentially the next time 7 o'clock rolled around they had to signal their intent to comply. Yeah, and that does end up happening because then we hear a radio in that room where Bond and Q are talking that's sort of like, well, yes, this is the BBC radio service and you, you're not hearing things. Big Ben did indeed strike eight times at 7 p.m. This is owing to a mechanical failure. And the last time this happened was actually uh, 1785. And, you know, just sort of like playing it off like a fun piece of trivia, you know, like, oh, yes, no, you weren't hearing things. That actually did happen. Whereas, you know, it's, of course, because the government arranged for that to occur so they could signal specter so they're they're now receiving the follow-up of like you have to here's you know here's the you have to pay us the money and you know non-sequential bills and have it sent you know arranged for the drop-off or do they actually name a target at this point Um, it ends up it ends up being miami but i don't know that they actually name a target in their threat they they don't name one in their in their threat. No, Miami ends up being yeah. the fallback, though, right? Like that yeah, wasn't actually their in, in their initial intent. So full, <laughs> full disclosure to everybody listening, I watched this movie very late at night and was barely conscious in the third act. So my rem- memory of the details are a little slim today. But they they had like a pretty compelling purpose for these that for these weapons that weren't blowing up Miami, but I cannot remember for the life of me what it was off the top of my head. It's largely irrelevant. So Bond suits up for some underwater reconnaissance and goes to sort of poke around the Disco Volante, which they are expecting, basically. He he confirms that that is where the bombs will be, and they start like throwing grenades overboard and they chase him down with a little speedboat and he lets his air tanks and scuba mask go which they then recover and assume that he's dead because he of course is able to survive thanks to his miniature rebreather so that sort of comes up immediately as he swims back to shore and sort of flags down a passing vehicle he gets picked up by a helpful good samaritan who turns out to be fiona volpe who he marks as a problem almost immediately because of her stupid specter class <laughs> ring. She sort of just makes him uncomfortable by driving really, really, really fast. But then they get back to the hotel where apparently they're both staying. And then she lets him out and they go inside and go their separate ways. Yeah. No, she doesn't really have any reason to believe that Bond is who he's like, is anybody important, right? Because she hasn't met him at this point. I guess. She was just dispatched to assassinate Lippe. Yeah, I suppose. I I just sort of assumed that she did because Largo knew who he was. But yeah, anyway, lets him go. They develop some photos that Bond took and they're sort of like, okay, the Vulcan, which is the plane that carried the warheads, has to be around here somewhere. Why can't we find it? And so Bond and Felix go up in a helicopter to try and see you know they're sort of figuring out like okay well the disco volante's range is only this much so they would have to be able to go there and come back and the vulcan's range is only this much like what 
it's got to be around here somewhere, but we just can't find it. And they fly past Palmyra, where Largo and now Volpe are both there talking about Bond while they shoot clay pigeons. I notice it's weird. It's apart from the Baccarat scene and a brief scene, which is about to happen because Bond has been invited over for lunch to Palmyra, that Bond and Largo have very little on-screen banter. Mm. You know, like comparative to Goldfinger, where they have the entire golf game and then the bit with the lasers and then the other bit where they're sort of hanging around on the stud ranch. There's very little actual direct interaction between Bond and Largo, which I think is to the film's detriment. Yeah. Because they don't have as much. They just don't really have a lot of on-screen chemistry between them. Yeah. I Like... I don't know. Largo is kind of a nothing villain in this movie. He kind of is, isn't he? Yeah. Like, uh, he, you know, he's evil and he's got an eye patch and but he's mostly just a dude who hangs out in the Bahamas and has a boat and uses the yeah. boat to try and blow up the world. He He's not really like he doesn't have much screen presence. He's he's just kind of a nothing villain. So there's not much there. Like there's not much there for Bond to have chemistry with on screen he's just a very limp villain i think that's actually a, a great way to describe him because it de- he definitely sort of feels that way there there is a bit during this the the lunchtime date which i i do kind of like that bond villains tend to sort of keep up this facade of pretending not to know everything that's going on but basically like he had invited bond over for lunch somebody was skulking around the boat in scuba gear who died and then volpe picked up bond on the road in a car and now bond's come over for for lunch and largo's still like oh yeah hello i'll show you a nice time and show you around and still you know be threatening and make it clear that i can have you killed but not just kill you (laughs) for some reason but I do like the bit where Bond is just a complete ass to him because he's looking at his clay pigeon rig and talking about that. And Largo explains what it is like to shoot at the clay pigeons. And Bond's like, oh, that doesn't sound very easy at all. And then one fires and Bond, like almost without looking, just turns and blows it out of the sky and then goes, <laughs> oh, wait, no, it is, though. It's actually very easy. And just like, yeah, he, he plays it off as if he doesn't know how to use a gun. And then like, yeah, just like 360 no scopes the the clay pigeon and hands the gun back just being like oh it's it's not that hard while this is happening fiona the specter assassin shows up at bond's hotel room where paula is hanging out and fiona's surprised to see paula there and of course paula's very surprised to see fiona there fiona tries to play it off being like oh it looks like our man mr bond arranged a date for both of us at the same time and Paul is like, I don't know or believe what the heck it is you're talking about. But then there's a knock at the other door of Bond's room. And it's, you know, it's like knock, knock, hired goons. <laughs> <laughs> and they bust in and kidnap Paula. And we then very abruptly cut to something that is referred to as the Junkaroo. Oh, yeah, the Junkaroo. It's a Bahaman Mardi Gras kind of thing. That's right. Because Largo had asked Bond to accompany Domino to the Junkaroo. Basically be like, can you take her? I'm I'm busy tonight, probably blowing stuff up. He doesn't say that, obviously, right? <laughs> yeah. But he's like, I'm so busy later. Can you take her? And he's like, okay, sure. Okay. It's a little weird. But yeah, so there's a lot of shots of very ornate costumes and people doing music. And looks like a heck of a fun time. You know, there's like parade floats and things. Yeah. While he and Domino are there hanging out, Felix comes over and desperately waves him down and says that they can't find Paula. They don't know what happened to her. She's gone missing. And so Bond says, okay, well, Felix, you look after Domino. I'll try and figure out what's up with Paula because he figures that she's she's been kidnapped, which, which indeed is the case. Pinder, again, their man in the Bahamas, has arranged for an island-wide power cut so that Bond can sneak into Palmyra, Largo's house, because he's just sort of, you know, nip, nipped away from the parade just to bust into the bad guy's secret lair. Yeah. The, the power cut does indeed happen. Bond manages to sneak inside. 
unfortunately, just barely does not get to Paula in time. Basically, the people torturing her for information were distracted by the power cut long enough for her to take her cyanide tablet. Right. Rather than give up information. There's also, I should have mentioned, there's another character sort of in the periphery who ends up being important later, who is a nuclear scientist who's helping Largo, not maybe not entirely voluntarily. It's a little unclear. Ladislav Kutze, who he's just sort of like is generally kind of working for Largo and knows that Largo does horrible things like kills people and stuff and doesn't really seem to mind but ends up having a change of heart near the end of the movie. It, I mentioned him because he does he's sort of critical to the very end of the climax of the movie. So Bond is obviously upset that he can't save Paula, but now he has to escape. Palmyra ends up getting into a fist fight with one of the guys. They fall into Largo's pool. One of Largo's named hench goons is about to go in and fish him out or shoot him or something. And Largo's like, no, 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 no. I got a plan for this. And, uh, and what does he do, Matt? <laughs> <laughs> he closes a grate over the top of the pool and releases the sharks. Yep. He opens the thing between the, <laughs> between the two pools and the sharks can, can come through. He does exactly what you would expect somebody to do if they construct a passageway between their shark tank and their pool. Oh, my God. <sighs> there are shots in here, by the way, of Sean Connery cohabitating with sharks which was not sean connery's plan oh but they had these giant lexan sheets so they could film underwater and have shots of sean connery and shots of the sharks on either side of the lexan sheets but the lexan didn't go like all the way up and so you know the production designers were like well this will be fine as long as the sharks don't go exactly over there of course sharks immediately go exactly over there production <laughs> designers shocked pikachu face like it was just like it was like this will only be a problem if the sharks do exactly this one thing sharks do that one thing everyone yeah. Whoa. and so there's a couple there's a shot in here of bond in the tunnel and there's a shark coming towards him and and you can see him go like Whoa! and everyone in the special features is like he's not He's not acting in that moment and then cut to, you know, like a like a fairly old Sean Connery interview. And he's like, I was not acting, you know, <laughs> not happy about that. Yeah. The other guy gets attacked by sharks and then Bond is able there's, there's a lot of thrashing and gnashing of teeth in the pool. And then Bond is able to swim because of his amazing secret teeny rebreather he's able to stay underwater swim back through the shark tunnel out into the other pool and escape while no one's watching yeah this this is actually a really good fight scene mm -hmm. this is one of those ones that's like again it's like a really good exciting fight scene because like bond and the goon are stuck underwater they can't breathe neither one of them can breathe the grating is closed above their heads they're <laughs> embroiled in a, a fight to the death with one another underwater with sharks everywhere and and bond manages to sort of escape by just drawing blood on the other guy essentially like he wins like he the, the, he beats the other guy in the fight but the other guy is like bleeding which initiates a uh, a feeding frenzy among the sharks which distracts them long enough to give bond time to get away the whole thing is quite exciting it's a good scene i like it yeah no me too i think it's i think it's sweet Bond, having now escaped, has to go change so that he can get back to the Junkaroo, which I guess goes on for hours and hours because this seems like an awfully long time that he's been away. He gets back to his hotel room, or rather, I guess, Paula's hotel room, which, because Paula checked out, so the hotel gave her room to someone else, is the story that would never hold up for more than about two seconds because <laughs> Paula's only been gone for a couple hours and how would the hotel anyway fiona is in the room and she's having a bath and she's like oh hello oh you just caught me here in the bath oh goodness you know bond just goes and sits in a chair beside the there's a chair in the bathroom anyway he goes and sits in the chair and she's like well since you're here can you hand me something to wear so he picks up her shoes and he's like here you go <laughs> she has a towel around her hair which she uses to stand up and yeah get herself dressed but not for very long because of course even though there's this whole junkaroo happening they they do a sex bond in a real rush to get back obviously cutting to later how they've now done that and presumably showered again and gotten dressed and she's like completely done her hair this would take so long bond goes and opens the door but the hired goons are back and then 
Fiona uses that distraction to pull a gun on Bond, his own gun, which she took off of him. And he sort of yeah. makes a quip about like, he basically, he's, he l- tells her that he knew that she was with Spectre the whole time because he's like, that gun was under my pillow the entire time that we were doing that. By the way, do you think I enjoyed what we just did? And that was for King and Country, which is very, it puts me in the mind of, it was, uh, it was in one of the Naked Gun movies where Leslie Nielsen's character is like, by the way, I faked every orgasm. Right. It's just like, what? Yeah. what? I just don't understand why she waited the whole time before trying something. Why was she in the bath? Why not just hide there until he came back and get the jump on him? Why? I don't know. The whole thing doesn't really make sense. And so he he's like, well, you know, I, I, I hoped that you'd be sort of see things my way or whatever. And then this is where I mentioned this last episode. This is yeah. where they sort of lampshade the pussy galore moment where she's like, oh, you think you can just make love to a woman and she'll just come come prancing back to the side of good. I'm James Bond. I think my wiener is magic. Meh, meh, meh. Is basically, <laughs> basically, the, I'm paraphrasing, but basically yeah. <laughs> the tone of Not what that she's much. saying. <laughs> yeah. But it, it it still sort of doesn't explain why she didn't just, I don't know. I don't know. She really wanted to get some. I like, guess. I don't know. This well, is this is one of those things that you've just got to sort of give a Bond movie. Truth be told, this whole scene is an excuse for that exchange, right? Like they wrote this true. in as a thing that's true. like, oh, it'll be a clever way for us to issue meta commentary on the previous film. Mm-hmm. Now we have to concoct a whole series of events that lead us to this this exchange that we've come up with. But it it like. I strongly suspect this entire thing is like, well, Bond has to like he has to go to bed with the the femme fatale. And then also we can we can use it to to be clever, which I mean, it's one of those like, sure, you've got your words, but let's see the actions, which I don't think actually pans out as the movies continue. But, you know, it's it, I don't think it's ever quite as egregious. No, as the pussy galore turn. But again, we 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 popped off about that last episode. So they drive back to the Junkaroo, and I don't know why. Wait, sorry. I, I, again, I'm a little fuzzy about the like strict details of this movie, but the like they drive back. What are the goons there for? Right? The goons are in the car. I think they're trying to track down Domino. I, I guess maybe that's why. And they're sort of like, we've got to go get her back, so you're going to find out where she is for us to take us back to domino maybe that's why i'm a little fuzzy myself why why are they even kidnapping bond at this point like are they just bringing like is it just to bring him back to largo like we found him he was skulking around here you go largo to dispatch at your pleasure rather than like fiona's a well, like an accomplished assassin we know this and she's just been like haha i'm not turning good and holding a gun on bond would we not expect her to just murder Bond there? What purpose is served by keeping Bond alive other than foiling the plot later in the movie? Plot armor. Yeah. As they're stuck in the car, because of course there's a whole junkaroo happening down the street, a man comes over and sort of is just being generally inebriated at them. I can't tell if he's trying to sell them alcohol. Uh, he is. He's trying to sell them like a skiff of the bottom of a bottle of vodka or something. Yeah, And the goons are trying to wave him away while fiona is lighting a cigarette so bond kicks the bottle all over the men in the front seat grabs her lighter makes the alcohol explode (laughs) it's some it somehow explodes and then he uses that opportunity to get out of the car and run away as the they try to chase after him one of them does actually get a grazing shot on his ankle yes and so now we have this kind of cool chase slash fight scene through this massive parade with bond sort of hobbling along trying to get lost in the crowd hiding in a parade float while they're chasing this blood trail that eventually takes us to a bar right the kiss kiss club yes bond sneaks into the bathroom and sort of washes and bandages his his wound presumably it's not that bad i guess it was just a bit of a graze even though he seems to be bleeding quite badly yeah he's bleeding quite a lot out of this wound leaving lots of like visible drips of blood to try to blend in he basically asks someone to dance it doesn't really ask someone to dance he walks up to her at a one of the girls at the bar and is like why i'd love to dance and she's like well what and then they end up they end up dancing i think i read 
in somewhere in the trivia that this actress actually showed up again in Casino Royale. Like the 2006 Casino Royale? Yeah. Neat. Just as someone that Bond was playing poker with, I believe. I think that was... I'll have to look that up. Anyway, so as they're dancing, Fiona appears and is like, may I cut in? And the girl that he was dancing with was like, you should have told me your wife was here. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's so good. Yeah. She's so put out too. Yeah. She was sort of like, oh, this is kind of like fun and random. And I'm kind of enjoying this. This, this dude just dancing with me. All right. And then like, oh, his wife is here. <laughs> <laughs> so Fiona shows up. The goons block off all the exits to the bar this is like an open air bar i should have said but they block off all the all the exits and then very slowly and purposefully a gun creeps through the curtain as the music reaches a fever pitch clearly the gunman is waiting for the loudest point in the music to take the shot so that nobody will notice but bond sees the gun spins fiona around she takes the bullet square in the back yep and then all the henchmen are like, uh, 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 and they just bolt. <laughs> They're like, oh no, crap, what do we do? And they just, they just <laughs> run away because they're so startled. Yeah. And so Bond takes the body over to a table, sets her down, and quips, mind if my friend sits the, this one out? She's just dead. <laughs> <laughs> it's such a good quip. Gosh. It's very, very reminiscent of the delivering the, the driver in the back seat to government house in in dr no yeah oh here we go sorry i found it out diane hartford played the uncredited role of girl in kiss kiss club in thunderball in 2006 was a card player opposite daniel craig in casino royale oh that's awesome nice so there was a 25 years of james bond soundtrack cd that came out when bond was only 25 years old well i guess it might have been older than that at that point now i'm maybe dating myself when were cds around there there is a like a james bond soundtrack that cd that came out around the time that cds were new and cool maybe it was 30 years at that point which would have been 94 that sounds about right and the song that is playing in the kiss kiss club is this song which made it into the soundtrack like it's a big enough deal that it made it into the soundtrack of like the entire bond friend franchise which is mr kiss kiss bang bang if you want to talk about songs that are stroking off james bond this one mm. is uh is high on that list as well it's not a lyrical song in the movie but it does have lyrics and uh it's the lyrical version that's on the soundtrack cd to take the the first couple of verses of the like lyrics of this song for you he's tall and he's dark and like a shark, he looks for trouble. That's why the zeros double, Mr. Kiss Kiss Bang Bang. He's suave, and he's smooth, and he can soothe you like vanilla. The gentleman's a killer, Mr. Kiss Kiss Bang Bang. Huh. Demoiselles and danger have filled the stranger's past. Like a knife, he cuts through life like every day's the last. He's fast, and he's cool. He's from the school that loves and leaves him a pity if it grieves him mr kiss kiss bang bang uh, wow <laughs> it goes on <laughs> yeah apparently because i i didn't know about that but apparently instrumental versions of it are heard in various points in the movie most notably at the kiss kiss club uh -huh. but be because originally mr kiss kiss bang bang sung by dion warwick or warwick was going to be the the th the theme song that makes sense for this movie to the ex to the extent that they recorded several versions to try and find one they liked including a version sung by dame shirley bassey yep. who ends up singing you know several different bond films until they finally were like let's just do an original one and they wrote thunderball and got tom jones to sing it yep i'm pretty sure it's the the shirley bassey version on the like on the soundtrack compilation but yeah it, it was like a john barry song that they like I, I figured they had written it to be a, a theme song and it just mm -hmm. wasn't used. But anyhow, this is the most prominent place you can hear it in the background. And That's presumably so cool. they, they named the club for it. That's amazing. I contributed a trivia. Thank you. <laughs> I didn't know that. That's really neat. So it's sort of unclear what it, what exactly happens to Domino. Presumably Felix gets her safely out of the Junkaroo. And now 
th there's even more consternation back at MI6 that Bond basically has to find this thing like right now. Right. So he and Felix are back in the helicopter and Bond thinks that he's maybe seen something and they lower the helicopter. It's got water pontoons. They lower it down. They land, they look underwater and they see that the Vulcan is there covered by a net. Right. And they're also surrounded by sharks. So he tells Felix, all right, shoot one of those sharks to keep the other sharks occupied and I'll go swim down there and poke around and see what's up. Yeah. Which I is, I guess, maybe a plan that works. Anyway, he gets down there, determines it is the Vulcan. The crew is on board. They're all dead. He grabs Derval's family watch and dog tag. And he also determines that the warheads are indeed not not on board. It feels like part of the the problem with the movie is like Felix and Bond have been flying around in this helicopter, presumably with every spare moment they've had looking for the Vulcan and and not found it because there's like miles, square miles of ocean that they need to cover. And and of course, it's it's difficult to see the reason like they they divert from their plan because i cannot remember the name of the area but bond is like well like what about this area basically and and felix is like well we've searched every we've searched every area except this named place but it wouldn't be there because that area is full of sharks and bond is like oh you don't say basically it is like we should go there and they divert there and that then bond finds the plane because it it like it's not strictly like they just stumble across it. He, he sort of, it's not well depicted in the film, but he sort of like diverts them to the area that like, oh, that's just where they would put it because nobody would want to go there. So that that is how they sort of come across the plane. Right. Thank you. Yes. But he has to figure out a way to find out if the bombs are going to be on board the Disco Volante and when, because he knows right. they aren't on it now because of his Geiger counter camera. Right. So he meets up with Domino again, underwater, again, somehow. <laughs> they embrace and bone down underwater, or at least that's the implication. It's heavily implied that they have underwater snorkel sex. <laughs> like you do. I don't. Yeah, like one does. By the way, the character named Domino, all of her outfits in the whole movie are black or white or black and white. Yeah, which is a great little, like character affectation i think i think it's great all of the outfits are awesome like all of all of her outfits are rad yeah after you know wasting all that time with sex they sit around on the beach and they're chatting and bond is basically like so okay this largo guy what's the deal what's going on here and she's being super evasive he eventually says well i have to give you some bad news i have to upset you here and shows her the dog tag and the watch and tells her that Largo is the one responsible for killing her brother. A reminder, the NATO inspector who was given a body double at the beginning of the movie is Domino's brother. In case you lost that plot thread at some point, Vargas Largo's weird looking hench dude has a bead on, cause of course he's keeping an eye on Domino. He now has a bead on, on them and she spots him walking around sort of in the background. She just sort of idly is like, hey, Vargas is behind you. I don't want to make a big deal about it so that he doesn't get suspicious. And Bond's like, oh, okay, cool, 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 cool. And like reclines back really casually, resting his hand on the harpoon gun and then goes like, oh, ha, king, and pins Vargas to a tree with a harpoon. <laughs> and basically through showing her that Largo is a real SOB, convinces her to help him out by taking the Geiger counter on the boat and alerting Bond to when the bombs are brought onto the boat. Right. Bond also figures out where they're being stored and how they're getting back onto the boat. I was going to say that that's right because the, like Domino tips off the fact that there's like a bridge near his compound that he doesn't let anyone go by, like go near. And so Bond then is like, oh, well, I'm obviously going to go near that. And, yeah. like hat hatches a plan to to like he he basically like grabs i I may be skipping ahead ahead here a little bit but he like grabs one of the henchmen who's suiting up in scuba gear and like replaces him and then swims in and they they discover one of the bombs in this like facility where they're planning to move it back to the the disco volante yes that's yeah 
that's what happens yeah they can't tell that it's him because it's dark and he's wearing a scuba outfit but they ha- there's like a it's like an underwater cave with like a hidden rock door kind of thing where they're storing the things and so they go inside they get the amusing orange scuba whatever they load the stuff inside largo swims over near bond who's trying to not be conspicuous and then largo's like wait what's with that because he's wearing like a tight face mask but largo's like who is that is that hey that that's the guy that's bond what the hell and then he sort of like waves this is all done silently right because this is all underwater most of the movie from here out is underwater and pacing is an issue and he sort of is like waves the, to the other people and he's like look look him that guy get and he's like shoot <laughs> him <laughs> he helps the other people load and bond subdues the one guy who sticks around to try to kill him and then bond who has swallowed his little emergency pill or whatever is now stuck in this cave because they got the bombs out and the door closes behind right yeah Back on board the Disco Volante, Domino is sort of wandering around with the camera, realizes that the bombs are on board, which means that she has to give the cue to Felix, which is to get up on board deck. On her way up on board deck, she's interrupted by Largo, who's sort of like, I asked you to stay in your room. What's going on? Where'd you get this camera? What's going on with this? They sort of struggle. The camera falls to the floor, breaks, and Largo hears the Geiger counter noise and realizes that Domino's betrayed him. And ties her down to a bed and basically says that he's going to torture her with some sort of, he talks about some sort of like weird application of like hot and cold. He has like a cigarette and a handful of ice cubes and he's like hot and cold applied carefully and with precision will result in the excruciating pain or something weird. Yeah. It's like some kind of nondescript whatever. And now the nuclear physicist has decided to get a conscience and is like, Miss, Miss, Mr. Largo, sir, you said you wanted to know when the bombs would be armed. And he's like, oh, I did ask for you for that. Darn it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, fine. You stay here. I'll tie it up. I'll be back to deal with you later. Mm, shakes fist. Yeah. Felix rescues Bond from the cave because the cave has like an open part that it's like a island. There's a channel that the helicopter can like drop a cable down through to this underwater cave, basically. Bond gets rescued. As soon yeah. as he's back on the helicopter, he's like, tell the Marines my, they're going to Miami. They're going to blow it up. And so then we cut immediately to a whole bunch of paratroopers coming out of a airplane on the outskirts of Miami and some really cool aerial shots of Largo and his weird little orange submarine and all of his frogmen underwater heading for Miami with this bomb. And then the first of the Bond franchise's many grand underwater fight scenes and boy this goes on for a while i was gonna say and probably also the longest yeah there's just like it's cool and like underwater photography so the bond movies have this thing they have this routine thing that they do where they they're always on the cutting edge of things and they will find something that's fairly fresh or newly invented and they'll get like the person who invented it to be like oh that's that's really cool you need to come on a bond film and do that thing And so this was like someone who'd made amazing innovations in underwater photography and whose name I don't have handy and I apologize. So they filmed all these amazing underwater sequences, like some were done in a soundstage and some were on location, but they did so much cool stuff and they had all these two massive stunt teams and so many extras underwater, but it's just so hard to kind of follow what's happening. It's just like a lot of like a guy wearing a black suit gets shot and then a guy wearing an orange suit gets shot and then that just kind of keeps happening for like five solid minutes. Yeah. There's like one thread because Bond joins the fray sort of partway through where like Bond is skipping from like fight interaction to fight interaction and like intervening on behalf of the like U S Navy dudes. He'll go over to one guy and like cut the guy in the black suits air hose and then go out, go to another fight and like grab the goggles off the dude and what have you. And like that little through line works. Okay. But yeah, you, no, this this scene drags on. It is interminable. It goes on forever. <laughs> I, I say this because it was 2.30 in the morning when I was watching it, and I was barely capable of keeping my eyes open. And, and the fact that it's all, like, subdued underwater noises and, like... <laughs> it did not help <laughs> it's like it's like white noise the action scene yeah but occasionally there's a sound effect like occasionally there's like a real 
visceral punch noise and it's sort of like where did that come from that's weird yeah but yeah there's a bit where bond like it's round three for that rebreather gadget because he lures three of them into a place with his because he's got the little submarine backpack on he lures three of them into a like wrecked ship leaves his submarine backpack there so they're like oh he has to be around here somewhere sneaks outside with his rebreather and drops a grenade in there and then you get a you know the comedy shot of like a a flipper floating up to the surface (laughs) they all have these comedy (laughs) yeah they all have these not not all of them some of them have these little sort of like single man putt putt submarine things which were all practical by the way all these props worked like no wonder this this movie used its budget but apparently the the main thing was built by a person in miami that they were like here's the design ken adam gave us and everyone was like no one can build that and eventually they found someone in miami who was like yeah i can build that but they had to do like alternating shifts so they could be working so this machine shop could be working on this thing for like 24 hours a day to get it done in time but by heck it looked good you know and the thing actually functioned yeah yeah no that like it's totally understandable well like why the the climactic battle goes on as long as it does because like the whole underwater battle thing is super cool and it's clear that they spent 90 percent of the, the budget of the film at this point they have support of like the u.s military probably or at least they have a, a good facsimile thereof with like a battleship and uh, a b-17 plane come in towards the end of the film and like dozens of scuba divers involved in this fight and and it's like there's quite a lot of scale to it yeah so i can i can totally understand why they would want to feature it so heavily in the film but it's not as impressive now yeah so eventually after a lot of help from the marines most of largo's men are subdued and largo himself escapes back to the disco volante and bond pursues him Largo goes inside and the trap door is closed and Bond grabs onto one of these like hydrofoil fins near the front of the boat that's underwater, which is weird because this boat's not a hydrofoil. It's just a giant yacht. Ah, but wait, we have engaged emergency saucer separation. And as they are being pursued by the American Navy, the Disco Volante releases a massive wall of smoke behind it to obscure it and separates the front half of the boat discards this shroud on the back of it and busts out as this super fast hydrofoil and just like hauls away from basically this gun platform that they've left behind with a surprising number of people still willing to try to man the guns on it considering they <laughs> have like the navy bearing down on them and like firing at them yeah speaking of things that are very unlikely to happen bond somehow has managed to hold on to this hydrofoil by the wing <laughs> yeah, yeah. Wing, and pull himself up on top of the boat I'm, I'm fairly certain that you'd get torn to shreds by that but you know okay the nuclear physicist is freeing domino from her bonds as bond breaks onto the boat and engages in a 1v4 i think it is fight in the bridge deck of the disco volante managing to defeat three of the men before it's just down to him and largo and the really awkwardly rear projected sped up footage of zipping around (laughs) various islands south of florida that the boat ostensibly threatens to run into eventually he does manage to defeat the other three men largo gets the drop on him and is holding bond at gunpoint when he is shot and killed in the back with a harpoon gun by domino taking revenge on her brother who is not only happy that he's dead but happy that she got to do it Mm -hmm. largo slumps awkwardly onto the steering wheel and they're on a collision course so they get to the outside deck bond throws the life preserver onto the nuclear physicist flings him off the boat he by the way is never seen again we assume that he's well bond and domino dive underwater as the disco volante crashes into a island and explodes violently it is immolated john steers the visual effects guy was working with a new kind of explosive that he did not experiment with prior because they only had enough for the one shot and it blew up way more powerfully than he expected (laughs) this was filmed in the bahamas when they got back to nassau they'd blown out the windows on main street 
Wow. Yeah. <laughs> it was this moment of like, where did that boat go? Like they were expecting, you know, big fireball, you know, and then there's bits of boat everywhere. And they were, there was just it, the explosion happened and the boat was just gone. And they're like, what did we do? And then they got back to Nassau and a bunch of windows were blown out and they were like, holy crap, we could have killed someone. <laughs> Wow. Anyway, a U.S. military plane flies overhead, drops a life raft for them, which they climb inside. There's a balloon connected to an air tank. Bond inflates it, puts on a a vest that's connected to the balloon, grabs onto Domino, and the plane comes back and picks them up with a... A Fulton. Thank you. The plane picks them up with a basically the Fulton system, which is a, a a real thing. You might know it from you know like Metal Gear Solid Five, but it's actually a real thing. This was a very cool and fancy thing in this movie. It was in one of the Batman movies as well, wasn't it? It was. It was in uh, the Dark Knight. Yeah, and picks them up and just they just sort of go whoop and carries them off, and then that's the end. It's like oh, and scene. James Bond will return. They don't even get to do it in the life raft. It's like, what is, is this a Bond movie? What's what's going on here? Presumably, the the physicist made his way back to the life raft, but at that point, he's already missed the the, the like rescue. So yeah. he's pretty screwed, just hanging out on a desert island in the middle of the Bahamas. Okay, another thing that I like, I don't know that I would trust. Something that scares me: Bond puts on a harness to be picked up by the Fulton system. Domino hugs bond <laughs> he sort of holds on well, he holds on too when the plane lifts them out of the boat at like airspeed though right like i i do not trust my ability to hang on that well i want my own harness yeah no absolutely all right your your personal power ranking getting fulton as the passenger without a harness holding on to someone who is harnessed or swimming in the pool connected to a different pool full of sharks i'd take the pool i'd take the pool over the fulton i think i think i would too because <laughs> a couple of things have to go catastrophically wrong for the shark thing to be a problem this i just have to lose my grip a little bit yeah i, I think i i think i take the shark pool yeah so there you go there's 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 thunderball so what'd you think it's one of those things that definitely I mean, I I think we sort of addressed it at the beginning where it's sort of like it had a it had enough stuff in it, but it didn't quite the whole didn't really land. But even then, I, I totally agree with you that Largo is just kind of a of a Bond villain. Yeah. He's just he, he's fine. He's just there like Adolfo Selly isn't doing bad work necessarily, but just like he and Bond don't have anywhere near the same on screen chemistry as goldfinger did and it's just kind of yeah and there's a couple scenes that i'm sort of like why is this happening like in the universe of the movie i don't understand why this needs to be here yeah so i i would i put this one to power rank this on the list of all four movies so far oh gosh actually this would be at the bottom all right it's the same for me oh really yeah there you go I, yeah. I was i was just like well wait we've only looked at four of them and uh, yeah, I think it's still, it's from Russia with Love. And then I can't remember where I left it last episode, whether it was Dr. No or Goldfinger in second and third, but then you this- You were from yeah. Russia with Love, Goldfinger, Dr. No, and Thunderball. Right. And I was from Russia with Love, Dr. No, Goldfinger, and Thunderball. Mm-hmm. So yeah, I, I agree. I put the Goldfinger theme song ahead of Thunderball, though I do quite like Thunderball. Yep. Same here. I'm having a hard time objectively viewing the opening titles, and I just don't think they're as visually interesting as the two that Robert Brown John did for From Russia with Love and Goldfinger. Yep. So I guess I guess opening titles third. Agreed on all counts. All right. My favorite Bond quip of this whole thing is absolutely got to be the bit in the Kiss Kiss Club where he's like, is it okay if my friend sits this one out? She's just dead. It's so good. Yeah. It's so... It's so callous and <laughs> it really funny is and well delivered it's just so well delivered yeah i think that one's great i think the tossing the the flowers in the oh, opening yeah. sequence is yeah if that might be mine just because it's like so hilariously unnecessary and not just unnecessary it makes it worse for him 
Yeah. <laughs> and there's another bit later in Shrublin's medical where he's trying to get out of the room that he's snooping around in and he's halfway out the door and then there's a fruit bowl and he's like, oh, I'll take a grape. It just goes back in the room, grabs a single grape and then leaves. And it's like, what the, what's wrong with you? <laughs> So the thing is, it's still a Bond movie, and it's definitely not my favorite, clearly, because we've just discussed that. But there's still enough fun stuff in here that I'm like, yeah, this is still, you know, it's worth, certainly if you're doing like, if you're, as we are for this, if you're watching the series, it's still worth watching. But if you only have so many movie nights in you, you, you know, you could probably give this one a miss. Yeah. This is definitely, though, like, if it's three in the afternoon on Thanksgiving Day, and TBS is airing a Bond marathon, and Thunderball comes on, you probably watch it. Oh, yeah. I think so, too. But that will do it for our rewatch episode of Thunderball. We'll be back next time with You Only Live Twice from 1967, one that I admit I remember very little of, though I Ooh. guess that's been sort of an ongoing theme. Well, I have good news and bad news for you, Graham. Oh, no. Is this the one where he disguises himself as someone from Japan? It sure is. No. Okay. I forgot. I didn't forget about that. I hoped to pretend like it never happened, but it definitely did. And we'll talk about it next time. Yeah. Until then, I have been Graham and that has been Matt. I'm still Matt. And this show and everything we do is brought to you by you and your kind support of our Patreon at patreon.com slash loading ready run. Shout outs to Featherweight for the art, Matt Griffiths for the video editing, and Heather for doing all the YouTube podcast admin stuff. And until next time, this podcast will return. Mm-hmm.